Uh, a lot of great presentations throughout the past couple weekends here. Uh, we appreciate you spending some time with us to hear about the Barrington Greenway Initiative. Um, so we're going to get into the details of what the, the Barrington Greenway Initiative is, or the BGI for short. Um, but before we get too deep into this, I want to just explain a little bit about our organization. So my name is Kevin Scheibler. I'm the Restoration Manager for Citizens for Conservation here. Um, I started back in about 2018. I've been working with the group for about three years now. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of background on who CFC is, is some context towards this greater multi-county uh, initiative to restore and rewild a lot of the natural areas of Barrington. So Citizens for Conservation has been a community member uh, in the Northwest suburbs, Barrington primarily, for 50 years now. Uh, we started in 1971 and we're celebrating our 50th year anniversary this year. I uh, had a lot of fun um, you know, big events planned for that, but unfortunately, you know, with COVID, things are a little bit goofy this year. So we're hoping to have as many folks out as possible when it's safe. Um, but so we started back in the 70s. This is really kind of at maybe one of the births of the conservation movement. Um, there's a lot of like big environmental uh, initiatives going on at the time. This is when we're getting the US EPA starting to be formed. Clean air, clean water just got passed. Um, a lot of these different initiatives are starting to be formed. And out of that, uh, citizens for Conservation kind of stemmed out of that initial wave there. So we started primarily as a conservation organization, um, says it right there in our name. And I think at the time we were trying to find out who exactly we were. Um, so really in the first few years, we focused on things such as recycling, um, really promoting that in the community, doing some environmental education. But then we started to get into this idea of land preservation, you know, um, just keeping land out of development, uh, land kept natural is uh, good inherently in itself. Um, so today, fast forward to today, we own about 480 acres now in the Barrington area um, that's split between 12 different preserves. The largest being our Flint Creek Savannah. It's about 144 acres. Our smallest is a small little woodland chunk called Styremark Woods. It's only about three quarters of an acre. Um, ever since we started, we've always had a focus on the Flint Creek watershed. And we'll show you what that looks like in a couple slides here. Um, but this is one of the main tributaries to the Fox, or not the main tributary, but a tributary to the Fox River. It drains about 36 miles of southeast McHenry, southwest Lake County, and then northwest Cook County as well. Oops. So uh, in the early years, again, you know, we, we got into this idea of land preservation. Um, we ourselves were acquiring smaller chunks of land. You know, 480 acres isn't nothing, but it's not a huge chunk either. But we also worked a lot with our county forest preserve districts. So we would help lobby and build support for different acquisitions in the community here. Um, you know, we, we couldn't quite afford a 900 acre chunk of grassland that was going up for sale or a 900 acre farm that was going up for sale. But our county forest preserve districts were able to. So we helped lobby for a lot of these acquisitions, as well as even did some uh, land swaps back in the day, especially with the Lake County Forest Preserves. Uh, we would acquire small chunks like Ela Prairie. Um, and then return them over to the Forest Preserve District after they're able to pass a referendum or acquire the funding to acquire these. But so a lot of this land was starting to be put aside in the Barrington area, um, you know, starting around the 70s and moving on through the 80s and 90s. And we started to wonder, well, what's the best use for all this land? And this could go back to, you know, your classic conservation versus preservation, John Muir versus Adel Leopoldian, um, you know, philosophy. But we started to look at this idea that was really being formed out in the North Branch with Steve Packard and the Soam Prairie Stewards and decided that we wanted to try to use this whole idea of restoring these uh, ecosystems back to health or back to what they would have been uh, pre-European settlement. So I won't belabor that point too much. I know a lot of you out there that are attending this today probably know more on the subject than I do. But so back in 1986, we decided to really start taking this venture on. So back behind you here, you can see this is our Grigsby Prairie. This has gone through a lot of different iterations. It was starting to be donated to us back in the mid to late 80s. And at the time it was all hay meadows. Um, I think at some part too, part of it was actually a golf course and a lot of it had been degraded. So we started to take this chunk of land and take this venture of trying to restore it back to uh, a native you know, prairie and savanna ecosystem. So in the early years, we really focused on remnant seed collection uh, one of our biggest seed sources was, and still kind of is in a way, uh, the railroad tracks that run out here in Barrington. So it's the Union Pacific Northwest Line. It's the same one that runs through a lot of the Northwest suburbs here. 
Palatine, uh, Palatine Arlington Heights, all those same railroad. Um, so there's a right of way that's been protected really since the railroad was installed at the turn of the century, or early 1900s. Even up until the late 70s, I've heard stories of the locomotives would throw hot coals off the train and burn off all the vegetation to keep the brush from surrounding it, which actually helped promote all these prairie plants. So a group, a small group started going around trying to find any little pocket of remnant seed that they could and expand out and then broadcast the seed into some of these restorations. So even today, you know, we're still experimenting with a lot of different uh, restoration techniques. But back then, you know, we were really trying to figure out how to go from hayfield to prairie. And so here's a photo of Grigsby from 1986, in fact. So you can see here, um, this is actually one of our best areas today now. But back in 86, we decided to look at, you know, some of the other people that might be broadcasting seed, such as farmers. What do they normally do? They go through and they till up the land and they broadcast their seed produce their crop. In our case, our crop would have been prairie plants. I found out that this was a terrible idea, <laughs> really promoted a bunch of weeds to grow here, especially sweet clover. Uh, to this day, we still have to battle a couple sweet clover strings here, but you know, throughout the 90s, there was you know loads and loads of the sweet clover we had to pull. Um, so we really started to take on this experiment and figure out how to rebuild these ecosystems that have been lost so here's another example. So over here on the left-hand side, this is our Flint Creek Savannah. This is in 1999. Um, it's the year that we acquired the property. So you can see it obviously was all farmed um, up until the year we acquired it. So that's all just soybean there. And then this photo here is from 2014 or 16, I believe. Um, you can see here now there's a, a wide array of different ecosystems where that uh, soybean all used to be. So again, kind of using some of these experimental restoration techniques, we took an area of hydric soil that used to be all farmed, busted up the drain tiles, and actually regraded this to mimic a prairie pothole wetland here. And so we now get a bunch of migratory waterfowl, like blue winged teals each year. It's always kind of fun to see them stop by. This would have been typical of you know the prairie potholes that would have been out here in the Fox River hill and fen section. But in addition to that too, we also have some of these floating islands out here. These are um, very similar to the ones that are down on the river walk there. If any of you have ever seen those on the Chicago River in downtown Chicago, uh, there's these floating mats that we planted a bunch of native uh, vegetation onto it with the idea of filtering out the, the water here. The surrounding areas really have a lot of excess fertilizer runoff that goes into our waterways. So these are meant to filter that out. Likewise, if you look back behind um, the barn over here, there you see this big mound. That was not there back in 1999. What that actually is, is instead of, you know, taking that old barn down and filling up a landfill, all the wood actually was used by one of our old board members to build a house up in Wisconsin. And then a lot of the leftover rubble was stacked here. And we backfilled it with sand and gravel to mimic a gravel hill prairie that would have been um, typical of this region. So this now hosts a, a nice little assemblage of plants. We use it as kind of a wild seed nursery. Um, a lot of our typical dry hill prairie species, as well as some more rare ones, like short grain milkweed live on this hill now. So it's a lot of this, these techniques that we've been trying out for years and years. Uh, a lot of successes, but 10 times more failures in between using those lessons learned. So in 2017, after you know, decades and decades of this restoration work, you know, the birth of an idea came through and it wasn't formulated in 2017. This was actually a few decades in the making. So this goes back all the way to one of our um, first board members or one of our first uh, leaders in Citizens for Conservation, Wade Vanderpool. And if you might recognize that last name because his son, Tom Vanderpool was the one that actually came up with this idea of the Barrington Greenway Initiative, as well as so many of these other restoration techniques that are used in the area now. So. The idea was that, you know, we have 480 acres, that's all fine and good. If we restore all 480 of acres of those to pristine, high quality habitat, that only gets us so far, right? Let's use the example of a Blanding's turtle. A Blanding's turtle needs at least 1,000 acres of contiguous um, uh, natural area to be able to be, have its own, you know, um, range or source there. And so we started to turn to some of these other large natural areas that were in the region. If you remember, we worked with our forest preserve districts to set aside some of these large areas. Obviously, the forest preserve districts both have been doing this themselves for the last uh, over 100 years now in Cook County's case. And so we tried to figure out how can we leverage our resources and their resources 
to try to really expand out the restoration effort in a certain geographical area. So in 2017, a few different nonprofits, Citizens for Conservation, Audubon Great Lakes, the Bobbling Foundation, and Friends of the Forest Preserve sat down with representatives from both the Lake County and Cook County Forest Preserve districts and pitched this idea to them to say, we have a lot of volunteers, we have a lot of seed, we've you know learned a lot of lessons and we're happy to try and share some of those resources and work with you to really build some of these ecosystems and these larger scale natural areas. Most recently, we've been starting to work with the McHenry County Conservation District as well now too, but back in 2017, these six partners really started this venture. We'll get into what all we're doing here in a few slides, but I'm sure a few of you are wondering at this point, why Barrington? What's, what's so special about Barrington? Well, uh, truth be told, I didn't realize how large Barrington was until I started working for Citizens for Conservation. I thought it was just another village in the Northwest suburbs. You know, there's a lot of villages out here. We've got Hoffman Estate, Jellington Heights, uh, Barrington, but turns out that Barrington's actually a lot larger of an area that most people would think. Um, there's two primary watersheds that this uh, area drains and that encapsulates the entire watershed. So again, the Flint Creek watershed, um, it runs primarily through North Barrington. Here's where Citizens for Conservation is. We're right over here off 22. And Flint Creek really drains a lot of this area, links up to the Fox River there. But then similarly, in the South Barrington region, we have the Spring Creek uh, watershed that runs through most of the Spring Creek corridor that you can see here, which is all already protected land, 4,000 acres of it, runs through mostly rural area out into the Fox as well too. These are two of the higher quality streams located in this area and they drain you know, most of Barrington here. Barrington actually sits at um, nine different villages. There's a, an entire council of governments for the different villages of Barrington. Um, so this isn't just one area. There's a lot of different villages within the, the greater Barrington area, we'll call it. So there's Lake Barrington, North Barrington, Barrington Hills, South Barrington, a lot of different forms of Barrington. But then also too, you'll notice that we sit right at the corner of four different major counties. So again, here's Citizens for Conservation, and we have about a two minute drive to be in McHenry County, oops, and about a 10 minute drive to be in Cook County. And here we are sitting in Southwest Lake County. Um, so we're really at this crossroads. Now, a lot of us know that nature doesn't really care what county they're in, right? Does a white-tailed deer care if your Michigan lily's in Lake County or Cook County? No, it's coming to eat that Michigan lily one way or the other. Um, so we decided why should we focus only on a certain county or a certain geographical area? Being a nonprofit, you know, we're able to move a little bit more nimbly between these counties and really do what's best for the ecosystem as a whole. So here's a little bit nicer of a map of what the Barrington Greenway Initiative looks like today. Um, so it's, a, it's a definitely a north-south initiative, so it's a little bit difficult to get the entirety of it on a, a screen like this here, but it gives you a good example or a good idea of what we're trying to accomplish here. So again, here's Citizens for Conservation. This is where our headquarters are, where the star is. And it's right there at Flint Creek Savannah property, which is about, again, 144 acres. And you can really see how there's this patchwork of these smaller preserves that start to connect a lot of the larger natural areas uh, that have already been set aside by our local forest preserve districts. So down here in the south, this is the, the northern tip of the Spring Creek Forest Preserve um, District again here. That's more or less 4,000 contiguous acres. And you can see how that's just a hop, skip, and a jump away from our large Grassy Lake Forest Preserve and Cuba Marsh, both of which are around between seven to 900 acres of contiguous grassland ecosystems too. And so you follow that up the Fox River there and you can see that there's already this huge corridor put in place through the lake and McHenry County conservation districts here too. So you start to see how setting aside certain key pieces of land and strategic land acquisition could help really rewild and create the stepping stone uh, influence in the Barrington area here. So when we sat down in 2017, we had three large goals. Um, we're gonna talk mostly about the first two today. Um, but, you know, we'd be happy to answer questions about the third goal as well, too. But our first and our most ambitious goal is to create high quality linked ecosystems. Um, you know, we know that nature needs a lot of area and that you know, there needs to be a flow of genes through different plant materials, through animals, for things to be sustainable and move forward into the future. For any big project like this to work, we need to engage our local community. 
Um, you know, Citizens for Conservation has been a huge community member for the last 50 years in the Barrington area. We have a great relationship with our school district, um, a lot of the different other nonprofits in the area, um, just as well as you know the community at large. You know, we've always been able to give back, but then tap into that community too to help further our mission. The, we would not be at the place that we are today if it wasn't for our community members coming out to volunteer on you know 95 degree days during the summer, negative 10 degree days during the winter, and just giving it their all every single week, even on Thanksgiving, you know, the holidays, everything. They come out to help us further this mission to you know really recreate these ecosystems and lastly we're trying to create habitats that support rare plants and animals um, we won't talk too much about this one today but we did have the luxury or the exciting uh, opportunity to reintroduce the smooth green snakes to uh, one of our properties back in 2018. Um, this is a one of the chicago wilderness priority species that's declined rapidly due to habitat fragmentation um, as well as just general loss of habitat so you're all a smart group out there. You probably know more about this than I do again too. But again, the, the general idea is that we have all these large conservation areas that are already set aside through the public-private partnership, um, through their county forest preserves and private nonprofits. And so what we're, what we're really trying to do is really promote the restoration of these large scale areas while also building corridors if and when possible. So the corridors could take a few different approaches. You know, for instance, our Flint Creek Savannah property has a large chunk of Flint Creek, hence the name, that runs through it, through a couple of different private landowners, but then a huge chunk of it is then protected through the uh, Lake County Forest Preserve system. And so we could actually create a true tangible corridor there to provide, you know, refuge for these different um, climate refuges, refugees as, you know, things start to warm, we'll actually create patterns and corridors for these uh, different species to be able to move between preserves as well as to engaging our local homeowners to plant even just a couple natives in their yard uh, we have a habitat corridors program which is all run through volunteers that come out and work with homeowners on how to best promote uh, habitat in their own yard there and um, really just promoting the use of natives because again we aren't a part of nature sorry we are not um, different from nature you know our backyard doesn't stop where nature goes. So to be able to really integrate the whole idea would really rewild the entire area. So that's a very pie in the sky goal, uh, but here's how it's actually looking out so far. So this is from 2018, um, a little bit different color schematic here. I think this is through the Chicago Living Corridors map. But you can see that all these uh, orange dots here all represent a homeowner that has a certified habitat in their yard. So this is more than just having a couple natives. They have an actual small plot of land that's dedicated to um, the, the conservation and promotion of native plants. And so you can see, you know, we're just at the beginning of this, but you can really start to see how even every one of these single neighbors promoted their one other neighbor, you can really start to build out this pattern of this really whole integrated ecosystem throughout the entire Barrington area. And obviously our key anchor points then are our large grasslands and our large natural areas that have already been preserved. So that's a very abstract look at the BGI. Um, that's the 10,000 foot view. So let's let's talk about what we've actually been doing. Because um, we, we love to do strategic planning and thinking about the large scale stuff, but we're a group that likes to be outside and getting dirty a lot more than that. So over the last three years, since this initiative has started, we've had maybe three big target areas, but it's not the only areas that we work in, but these are like the three main focuses that we've been really trying to push. So the first one I want to talk about real quick is the Grassy Lake Forest Preserve. Um, again, we talked about this a few times already throughout this presentation, but you'll see up here in your left hand corner. This was actually one of those forest preserves that we helped to influence the acquisition of back, uh, I think it was in the early 90s. Um, so we were able to help the Lake County Forest Preserve set that land aside. And then through the, the targeted strategic plan between Lake County Forest Preserve staff, the Grassy Lake stewards, and then BGI volunteers coming out on work days, we've been able to do a ton, a ton of work over the last three years. So since 2017, about 25 acres of buckthorn have been removed all through volunteer work days. Uh, CFC and the Lake County Forest Preserves were able to leverage finances together to fund the restoration of a high quality sedge meadow. Uh, there was a lot of cattails, phragmites, purple loose drive trying to take over this wetland. Um, so we we're able to leverage our finances and go out to get a grant um, to get you know that work done for us 
And then on our BGI workdays, we've been able to install over 30,000 wetland plants buffering that sedge meadow. And it's been great just to see that the huge strides that we've made each year at one targeted area here. Now, if the Forest Preserve alone took it on, you know, they would definitely make some movement towards it. Uh, but, you know, without having that volunteer labor provided from CFC and other BGI volunteers, they'd still be just so much further behind than where it is now. A uh, very similar story down in Cook County then. So this is uh, the Spring Creek corridor, again, up here in the left-hand side of your screen. You'll see there's more or less 4,000 unbroken acres. There's a few roadways that do dissect this area, but this is a huge, huge chunk of land that's been set aside in perpetuity from the Cook County Forest Preserves. A majority of it's fairly degraded, a lot of old hay meadows, uh, degraded buckthorn areas, things like that. Um, this little section here is what we call the Galloping Hill portion of Spring Creek. So this is in, I think, 2019. I believe it got burned off. You can see there's not much thatch. But this is actually a really nice hill prairie restoration that's been coming on here. Um, and so uh, we've had this longstanding relationship with the Cook County Forest Preserves. And a lot of this behind here actually was all seeded through CFC seed over the years. Um, in fact, I think it was 2008, we uh, actually rented a combine to come through our Grigsby Prairie. That's from a few slides ago. And it collected a bunch of seeds, and that was really one of the impetuses towards um, getting a huge amount of seed out to these large areas and recreating a larger scale grassland. And through the initiative over the last few years, we've been able to install 10,000 wetland plants at just two BGI workdays alone. There's two nice little wetland basins behind all these uh, happy campers here. And over the last three years, we've installed 363 pounds of seed from um, locally sourced seed. We'll talk about that in a couple slides here. But this is a huge push, again, at a very targeted area. And we've been able to see some great results from that, um, you know, targeted push. And a few of you might be wondering too, well, what's in it for CFC? Um, why go off and work at all these other forest preserve district sites when we already own land too? Well, don't worry, we've, we've been working at our own properties as well. Um, and, uh, you know, again, taking this targeted restoration approach, we've been able to get some larger scale results a little bit quicker than we would have used to. So just as a quick example of that, this is our Craftsbury Preserve. It's uh, one of our newest acquisitions. It's about 52 acres. And we're gonna see a series of slides here real fast from 2018 through 2020. Uh, when we started working on the site, it was really heavily degraded, mostly a bunch of young buckthorn, um, some of the verbascum here and just other weedy species. So through targeted removal of the invasives and heavy seeding in 2019, you can see that it already has taken on a better look. We got some of our pioneer species coming on, Indian grass, big blue, uh, yellow coneflower, nothing super impressive, but given from the year before it, a little bit nicer, still got a little bit of buckthorn going on. And then 2020, we're starting to see a little bit more of that stuff coming on. We also see some tall goldenrod. So I think we could all guess what we're gonna be doing in 2021. We're gonna get rid of some of that tall goldenrod. Uh, but we've been able to see some large strides at our own properties too, which normally what would have taken us maybe five to seven years to see, we're now seeing on a timeline of two to three years. So really, the one of the biggest tools that we've been able to use to get all this stuff accomplished is our BGI seed program. I know a lot of you out there are restoration practitioners, um, so you probably have known that seed is typically one of our biggest limiting factors, right? It is incredibly expensive to purchase. Um, a lot of the best quality seed is really hard to collect in quantity, mainly because we don't have a lot of the plants to begin with. But also they put off such fine seed. And then you go through all that process of acquiring the seed, but then you know you go out and throw it out. And sometimes you don't even see the, the seed that you've, you've spent hours acquiring or had to spend thousands of dollars purchasing. So really the only way that this initiative has been able to work to the capacity that it has so far has been through our seed program. And that goes all the way back to 1986 with those volunteers walking the train tracks, finding small little remnant pockets. They worked to meticulously make sure that we've always had locally sourced seed. So from the inception of CFC, we've only ever collected stuff, a seed source from within 25 miles of the Barrington area. Um, to this day, I'm not sure why we chose 25 miles. It was just uh, a number that we chose back then and we've stuck to that now. The idea is that we wanted to keep it very local uh, to the Barrington eco ecotype. And we've stuck to that, which has been great because we've, we've been able to really promote and expand these areas. 
So again, we we took that seed, and here's this is Galloping Hill on top of the hill again here in October of one of the years, and we've been able to take that seed and establish new restorations throughout the entire Barrington Greenway Initiative. And why that's cool is because now that is a new seed source for us. You know, after 10, 15 years of a restoration taking on, we can now collect seed out of these, and we get a real exponential collection of that seed over the years. For us, you know, our seed collecting really is a year-long process too. We really build our year around the idea of collecting seed. So just to give you a quick example of what that looks like, again, this is our Craftsbury Preserve back here. But as soon as we start to engage in restoration, we're already gonna identify areas that we want seed for, what type of seed we're gonna need. And we try to start looking at, you know, quantities of seed too. If it's a new restoration, we're gonna be trying to install seed at about 20 pounds an acre. If it's an older restoration that's lacking diversity, we might be going in at a little bit less. But so we'll start looking at this, you know, two to three years before the seed even hits the ground. And then we try to time out really our entire restoration schedule around those seeds. So for one, for instance, if one year we decide that sedge meadow is one of the big mixes that we're gonna need, you better believe we're out there the year beforehand burning off our sedge meadows and promoting the sedge meadows to really expand and grow as much as possible the next year so that we can collect as much seed as possible from that to really then share with our local forest preserve districts and other partners in the BGI. One of the huge things that's really helped us um, to expand out our program too has been the idea of this Barrington Greenway Seed Technician. So in 2018, uh, Lake County Forest Preserves and Citizens for Conservation sat down and worked out a jointly funded position. So we're very fortunate to be able to hire Luke Dahlberg in May of 2018. And Luke's main task is to basically go out and help us go after some of our harder to find species or species that just aren't represented as much in our restorations. So starting, I think it was in 2016, we came up with our sought after 60 list, which are 60 different species of underrepresented species and restorations in our area. It could be stuff that's incredibly rare, uh, such as heart leaved Alexander. It could be stuff that isn't maybe as rare, but we just don't have enough genetic diversity to that, such as white turtlehead, for instance. Um, you know, our, most of our stock has come from one single source over the years. So the idea is that we're trying to really promote the diversity with, you know, collecting the rare and hard to find things, but then also collecting the diversity in genetics. The seed technician has also been a great um, use for us too with propagating these hard to establish species. So uh, back in the, I think it was mid nineties, there was a development, um, a new, I think it was an apartment complex going in and they were basically gonna dig up this nice little prairie remnant um, over in Lake Zurich, a uh, surrounding community. We knew of this uh, hypoxis or the yellow stargrass population out there. So we were able to get out ahead of the bulldozers and actually dig up some of the hypoxis and replant them into one of our restorations at Flint Creek Savannah. We've had a great little population growing there now for the last two decades. Every single year we'll come through and collect seed from them. Every single year we'll go scatter those seeds. And every single year we wonder, well, where is it? Why aren't we getting any of this new establishment? And so what we, instead of doing that, which we've been doing for the last 20 years now and doing the same thing and expecting different results, we're now taking that small amount of seed that we collect each year and giving it to Luke to grow up to the Lake County Native Seed Nursery. So you can see here, that you know, these are two different species, the yellow stargrass and the violet wood sorrel um, that we've, we've, had, we've been able to collect seed from, but just had a hard time establishing new populations. We're actually able to grow them into new little plugs here. We'll harden them off and then plant them into the restorations with the idea of hopefully jump start starting some new populations. If this works out over time, hopefully in a decade, we'll be able to fill up a whole sandwich baggie full of hypoxia seed and actually just use that to scatter across our restorations. We also have been able to share a lot of resources uh, between partners, which has really helped expand um, the seed collecting ability for all of us. So again, we have different seed sources now uh, throughout the entire Barrington Greenway Initiative. So we have uh, different Lake County Forest Preserve sites that we both donated and collected seed from. Uh, Spring Creek, we've donated a bunch of our seed from over the years, and we now go back to collect some seed out of those areas. And then all of our CFC properties as well, too, we'll collect seed from. Each year we'll go out, uh, different steward groups, the Spring Creek stewards, Grassy Lake stewards, will all go out and collect seed. We'll bring it back to the CFC seed barn, which is a really high tech uh, 1900s barn with <laughs> just some old racks in it basically. 
but we'll take all those seeds, bring them back, and then we'll create, you know, between 10 to 12 different mixtures each year of seeds. And we'll have a, typically, you know, we had one big work day where we'd all get together and mix our seeds with perlite for volunteers to then go back and redistribute uh, the seeds across our different BGI sites. Um, and we had to separate that out a few times this year, just due to COVID again, but the mask came in really handy with all that dust in the air. So I'm sure a lot of you know that I've ever mixed seeds. But in addition to just that, we've also been able to work uh, at the Lake County Native Seed Nursery up in uh, Gray's Lake at Rollins Savannah to use their equipment. I'm gonna play this video on the right. I'm gonna hope that my head is not in the way here. Um, but so this machine has been really helpful. So I'm gonna just run this through real fast and explain it. So for anyone that's ever tried to clean a uh, pale purple coneflower before, you know how big of a pain in the butt it is to get those seeds out of that. This machine is absolutely terrific. It just runs the, the uh, unprocessed seed through here, drops the processed seed out the bottom here, and then all your chaff comes out the back end of this. So Lake County Forest Preserves has allowed us to come in after hours and use this machine, uh, which has saved us a tremendous amount of time. We used to spend a ton of work days just shoving uh, seeds through screens, like I'm sure many of you are used to doing. And instead of having to spend our work days doing that, we're actually able to now spend more of our work days getting out and then actually collecting more seed. So this works out for all of us, right? The Lake County Forest Preserve gets more seed um, donated to them through this BGI initiative. If we're able to go out and collect more seed, we're able to spend less time um, sitting there with the screens and just actually using the machines, which gets it done exponentially quicker. And then ideally too, um, you're able to burn off areas the year beforehand or you know the season beforehand at least to really help um, again create more of a, a viable seed source for that next season. And we, we really try to line that up with where we want to be seeding in the next year. So uh, we have a mostly volunteer burn crew, a volunteer burn crew here. We have a few staff from the Friends of the Forest Preserve a few CFC staff that come out, but then the rest of these folks are all uh, BGI volunteers. And these are always great times. We uh, were able to get people from Spring Creek Forest Preserve come up. We have people from Grassy Lake come over and help us. Um, and we all get together at you know the certain times of year when the burns are happening and get out and burn our CFC properties. So for each CFC property that gets burned, again, that means that's more seed that's gonna be going down to Spring Creek the next season, more seed that's gonna be donated to Lake County the next season after that too. Um, so it's really another one of these great shared resources where we're all able to get together at a time of need, such as burn season, and then be able to use that to really expand out the restoration effort in the area. So recently, too, we've been able to work with Lake County again. Um, we're, we're trying to establish a, a BGI burn crew that's more of a multi-agency uh, burn crew, and we're going to try to start burning some uh, key select areas in the Lake County Forest Preserve properties, too. Um, so we're, we're, that's in the process, and hopefully maybe we'll talk about it at the 2023 BGI Wild Things. Um, but, you know, without having these volunteer participation in our burns and the seed collecting and the weeding and everything, none of this really would be possible. So this is all done primarily through the use of this community-based volunteer group um, from the Barrington Greenway Initiative. So I've just talked your ear off now about a lot of the things going on with this BGI. And I'm sure a lot of you are thinking like, yeah, this sounds okay. It sounds pretty good on paper. Uh, it's really easy to show off, you know, maybe some of the highlights of the BGI. But what are we doing to actually say that we're, we're creating better, higher quality ecosystems? So what I want to do for the last section of this presentation is hand it off to Karen Glenemeyer. Uh, Karen has been a huge godsend for us. Uh, a lot of us, again, are more of just the, the hands-on people that you know like to look at plants and get dirty. Karen's absolutely one of those too, but she's also uh, brought about a really great way of monitoring and seeing how to judge if our ecosystems are actually getting better and how to judge you know when and where to use resources. So Karen, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. We good? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so my job here is to try to talk 
talk about um, how do we how do we learn if we're on the right track? So Kevin just described these incredible processes and goals, um, goals like high quality ecosystems, supporting rare plants and animals. Um, and if you set goals, it's really helpful to measure progress towards those goals uh, in order to know whether you're on the right track or whether you need to change course. So I'm gonna talk about some of the various monitoring methods and results that we've used in the um, BGI area. So uh, this is just a map with two lines on it. Uh, it's, it's a preserve called Galloping Hill in the Spring Creek Forest Preserves. And this is one of the classic ways of monitoring. Many of you have probably done it yourself. You just lay out a line, and the scientific word for a line in a prairie is a transect. And you walk along that transect, and every so often you put down uh, a frame, uh, either a circle or a square. We use squares, so we call them quadrats. Uh, and we put down a quadrat every 10 meters, and then we look down over that quadrat and uh, identify the plants and estimate their percent cover. And that just gives you a really strong sense of what, uh, what you're looking at in a really detailed, um, a very quantitative way. Um, and rather than showing you what that looks like in the field, I'm just gonna show you what numbers you can get out of it and what conclusions you can make from it, because um, I'm, uh, trying to uh, get us towards, you know, how is Kevin and his gang um, going to know if they're meeting their goals. So for this particular site, we walked these two transects and I'm just going to walk you through some of the kinds of results that you can pull out of it. Um, there are many, but here are some of the ones that we were really interested in. So uh, looking at those two different transects, um, we can, we've monitored them three times. 2008, 2010, and 2019. And you can see that um, the floristic quality has increased dramatically. So the floristic quality index looks at the, uh, the number of native species and combines that in a formula with their conservation value, their C value. And the C value goes from zero to 10, zero being weeds and tens being plants that you only see in, in high quality remnants typically. Um, so this would say that at Galloping Hill, uh, one of those goals of a high quality ecosystem appears to be being met. Um, and for context, if your FQI is, is above about 10, 9 or 10, you're doing pretty good at the, at the quadrat level. So um, this site is, uh, seems to be meeting that goal. Another thing you can do is pull out little questions that you're specifically interested in. So here are some things that the stewards wanted to know. So that first bar, at the top says that the number of plots with invasive sweet clover has decreased from 15 of those quadrats having sweet clover to only one. So that was a big focus of restoration was getting rid of sweet clover and we can see that they're succeeding and um, what they're doing is working. Um, grassland birds are also a big focus of this area. So um, bird monitors have found um, more than 20 grassland birds using the site every time they visit. So the stewards are restoring the floristic quality and at the same time they're maintaining good bird habitat. So that was a really important goal for this site. Um, another thing to look at is how many native species do you have per quadrat, per plot? And that's increased from two to seven. So again, that number's going up. Um, and then finally, um, people were interested in just the biomass. Are we filling in the bare ground? And we could look in and see that the amount of, of wildflower cover has increased from 44 to 63%. And that those kinds of little snippets can be good too for the, um, the public facing part of this. Um, you know, people like wildflowers and if you're trying to just get the public interested, that's a little thing you can pull out of your data. Another way to look at the data um, is to look at um, what's the composition. So we know that our FQI is high, but what's, can we drill down more and look at what does that mean? What's going on inside those numbers? And this is another way to look at it. So again, we've got the three different years and on the right, the fourth bar is a high quality reference site uh, uh, in Stone Prairie Grove. Um, and the way to look at this is there's just four different colors. The brown on the bottom is the weeds. Those are the C values of zero. The light green, um, those are C values one to three. So they're species that belong in natural areas, but they're not hugely highly conservative. Then the next green is the C values of um, four to six. 
So those really, you know, the, the really good matrix species that um, that really show you that you're making progress. And then the dark green are the C values seven to 10. So they're really high quality, highly conservative species that come in towards the end of a restoration. And you can just sort of even blur your eyes and see going from left to right that these this site is um, getting more diverse, getting more conservative, getting a higher range of types of species on site. And then the reference site on the right is just helpful because sometimes we ask ourselves, well, you know, what if the goal is to increase the floristic quality at some point, if that stops, that doesn't just keep going up forever. What's our end point that we're looking at? And so it's nice to have some sort of long-term stable reference sites to help you see, have in your sites where you're headed. Um, and then finally, you can just sort of talk about it more, uh, more verbally. So uh, putting it in context, the floristic quality has increased sixfold in just 11 years. And this is part of what Kevin was talking about with all the iterative learning that they're doing in BGI. Um, you know, Grigsby Prairie um, took a really long time to, to be so spectacular because people were just starting and just learning. And every time we do a new restoration, we learn how to do it better. And so uh, it's nice to see that we can do it faster um, based on what we've learned. Um, so that's one site. Another um, spot, um, this is another way of looking at data. This is a, an area called Hill Prairie, also in the Spring Creek Forest Preserves. And this transect goes across, uh, uh, it's, there's a hill uh, to the east on the right side, and then it goes down, flattens out um, towards a stream bottom area. And the quality really varies a lot across this transect. And so rather than lumping it all into one number, we thought it might be interesting to sort of pull it out across the graph. So you can, the, the graph below um, is just looking at each quadrat across the transect and they match up to the position on the transect right above them. So, so these quadrats are here and these quadrats are here. Um, and when we first monitored it in 2009, which is the, the red bar, um, most of the quality was concentrated on the hillside. But when we went out last year, we could see that the floristic quality is starting to expand and there's higher floristic quality farther out along um, the transect. And so that's been really gratifying. And that's been one of the goals of this area. Um, again, though, you can pull out specifics. Um, so, you know, it's great that the FQI um, has doubled in a pretty short amount of time, but we also see that sawtooth, sawtooth sunflower and tall goldenrod have increased. And there's another graph that I didn't show here showing that there's a lot of that going on over here. So it's a way of not only seeing what's our progress, how are we doing, but pointing out red flags like, oh wait, um, you know, goldenrod didn't used to be a problem. It's a problem now. Um, we've been sort of subconsciously ignoring it because it's more fun to focus on the, um, you know, the laetris, but um, we got to really pay attention to this because it's increasing. So the monitoring can help you um, really focus in on adaptive management. You know, we're going to change our management this year because we now see that we've got some new problems creeping in. Um, and then this is another, just another um, overview. So uh, this year we did a lot of different transects and a lot of different areas of BGI. And I'm not showing you on a map because I can't fit the map into one screen, but um, you can just see there's a bunch of different sites of a bunch of different quality. So we went out to a lot of different places. We looked again at the quadrat level FQI and um, you can see these sites are high quality. These sites, restoration is just beginning. And so that's exactly what we would expect. And the hope is to see those numbers go up over time. Um, we can also, again, do that um, fun graph where we parse it out into the different conservatism levels. And it's a similar picture. Here's our reference site again, that same reference site from before. And you can see that these three higher quality sites are kind of looking similar to this reference site. So is this one over here. Uh, these guys in the middle are mostly brown because they're mostly reed canary grass, et cetera. And we're going to expect those bars over time to hopefully start looking a lot more like these. Um, so it's just a great way to, um, to really see what's going on, measure your progress, pull out specifics. You can, you can go in the data and look for any species you want. You know, one of, another goal that Kevin mentioned is supporting rare plants and animals. So you can go in and say, okay, here's a particular 
um, you know, is the hypoxis spreading? Are we finding it? Let's go look for it in the data. But as you might, um, as you might imagine, this kind of work is very intensive. So the, the folks doing the work need to have uh, a very high level of botanical expertise. Um, it's, it's great for folks who want to learn their plants to come along and, and help and learn and, and help record data, but you do need to have at least one person who really knows their plants. And it takes a long time. You know, it's very labor intensive to sit down and look at each one of those quadrats and identify every species. So you can only cover so much ground with it. And so we were talking about, um, as, as lots of folks are talking about, you know, what's a, what's a way to cover more ground with less time and less high level um, botanical expertise required. And some folks a couple years ago started tossing around um, a method that really sort of tries to just encapsulate when a steward goes out to a site, what do they sort of intuitively think about and notice so that they are thinking this is a high quality area or a low quality area or here's what I need to do first. And so we tried to encapsulate it in this, this, um, this picture here. So this is just the timeline of a typical restoration sequence. So let's start with the words here. You know, the first part, um, restoration is just beginning and it kind of looks like this. Um, it's a lot of work. You don't really see a lot of increase in floristic quality. You're mostly focusing on controlling invasives and establishing just a matrix of grasses and sedges and, and um, plants that you can seed into. Once you've got the invasives under control, the heavy lifting's done, now it's seed, seed, seeds. Floristic quality um, jumps up. It starts to look much more like a prairie or a woodland. Invasives are um, still being actively controlled, but they're scarce. And then you finally get to this third phase where it's really looking rich and diverse, and it's sort of the maintenance phase. So you're hoping that you can maintain it just with fire. You're seeding the highly conservative species, really focusing on rounding out that diversity. And this graph just tries to sort of show how, um, you know, you have these big inputs of, of work and then it kind of levels off for a while and then you keep working and then it jumps up and the quality is much noticeably better and then you keep working and then it jumps up to this last phase. And, um, you know, some folks got together and tried to just put a number to this. We call this a uh, qualitative rapid assessment. So we give it a QRA score. These are the ones, these are the twos, and these are the threes. And you can have like a 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, trying to parse it out enough to be useful, but not so much as to drive ourselves crazy. And so what we did is we went out to some areas to try this out and we tried to map out what we were coming up with. Um, so again, this is this first site where I showed you those two long transects. Well, we went out to this site and um, we tried to do this QRA process qualitatively assessing the site. And here's the map that we came up with. Um, so um, the yellows are the ones, so that's the first phase. Uh, the blues are the twos and the greens are the threes. So this is based on just going out to the site with a group of people walking around saying, okay, are we, is there mostly still, you know, barrier weeds like reed canary grass where we can't move on until that's gone. Um, uh, and up here, okay, there aren't a lot of the barrier weeds, the floristic quality starting to increase. We don't have a lot of the rare species yet, but we're getting there. This is a really, um, you know, nice remnant wetland where it's all, everything's there that you'd want it to be. And we were really interested in comparing this to our quantitative transects. So do we get the same kind of answer with the two different processes? And so we just overlaid the numbers and um, you can see that it really does match up. So again, these are the, the 1.1s, 1.2s, 1.3s. Here are your twos and here's the three. And these are the FQIs, the floristic quality indexes of these two transects. And these are high. So remember anything over 10 is a really good area. And this is, this is pretty close to high. And you can see it matches up with these, you know, these 2.3s and 2.2s that are almost getting to that high level of three. And we did this with a few other sites just to see how it matched up. Um, so this is, um, this is an area called Headwaters or the 160. Um, it's a newer restoration. Um, and you can see these orange lines here are the places where we did transects. And uh, it matches up really, really well. So we have high FQIs here in a blue area that's a 2.3. Uh, similar story here. 
this area is a, is a 1.3 and the FQI is pretty low. Um, these areas um, crossed over from one zone to another. And if you do look at the individual quadrats, you see that the areas on the right, the quadrats were lower FQI. Um, one more site where we did this was Grigsby Prairie. Um, again, we've got, this is a high quality area. So there's lots of greens, lots of threes. And you can see how high the FQI the FQIs are in these green areas. This was an interesting one here. Um, it's a lesson in monitoring. If you're going to do a long linear transect, it's really good to try to make sure that it just goes through one habitat type. If you're going to lump it into one number. And you can see here that we inadvertently had put it in an area that was crossing a lower quality and a high quality area. So I went in and looked at the individual quadrats along this transect and um, the bigger the circle, the higher the FQI, and you can see it matches up really nicely where the lower quality quadrats are the ones that were in fact in this area where the QRA was low, was a one. So um, it's a really nice method that seems to match reasonably well with the quantitative method. So we feel like um, you know it's been field tested enough to be a useful metric. And the, the thing that makes it, um, super useful is not just the numbers and the maps you get, but it's the process of doing it that seems to be really most important. The way we found it works best is if you go out in a group of people. You don't just go out by yourself, but you take a group out and you do it together and you come to consensus on the number. And it's that process of getting to the number that's so useful because everybody's pointing out, oh, but wait, there's there's some goldenrod and is that really an important thing we should be focusing on here? That, tall goldenrod, um, you know, oh, but I'm noticing this, but I'm noticing this. And then you come to a consensus. And in the process, you've basically described your adaptive management actions. You've pointed out the things that need to be taken care of, the things that need to be maintained and nurtured, the things that are missing. And you're writing all that down. And then you've got your management plan for the next year. Um, and at the same time, you've got this nifty little number that you can put on a map and you can sort of visualize that whole map of the BGI area gradually changing from yellows to blues to greens over time. Um, so um, and, and what we found is that it's not only a great stewardship group exercise, but it's just a great community builder because a brand new person can come in and just soak it all in and learn like, oh, this is what stewardship is about. OK. Um, and you don't have to know a million plants. You just have to know, you know, kind of the, the main important ones. And it's a great way for a new person to learn a few new plants. Um, so we really like it. We think it shows a lot of promise. And it's a nice complement to the more quantitative monitoring that, that can give you more information, but, you know, with more investment. So um, love to hear thoughts and questions about uh, the monitoring part of the program. Uh, or anything that Kevin talked about. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karen. And again, thank you all for sitting through our presentation. Uh, hope you, you got some interesting little tidbits out of it. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So we'll, we'll leave this open here for questions now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for listening to the presentation here. Um, one of the things before we address any more questions, just listen to myself drone on to the first part again. I just really wanted to underscore that none of this is possible without volunteerism and our volunteers. Um, you know, the BGI is almost primarily a volunteer driven initiative here. There's a handful of employees, but most of this is all through volunteers. We have about, I think, 450 individuals on average each year committing to about six to 8,000 hours across all these different sites. So none of this is remotely possible without the help of the volunteerism and getting out and just getting your hands dirty. Okay, so it looks like the questions are starting to fill up here. So Karen, we can take a look. Yeah, some folks have asked about, um, you know, learning more about the QRA process. And I think um, I think I can speak for the whole gang that um, we'd be happy to have folks join us as we're going to be doing it more at more in more areas this summer um, in the BGI sites and we'd be more than happy for people to join us and see if you think it would work for your particular sites. Um, it's still pretty new. We're still learning, you know, what's the best way to do it? What do we get out of it? So we're happy to have more people come and learn about it. Yeah, absolutely. So 
When we first started this out, too, it was meant to be um, a system to help us do a little bit of resource mapping. You know, with working through so many different sites, it was hard to you know know exactly what we needed for each site. And we were trying to get volunteers trained up to be able to go out for us and say, oh, here's a weed problem there, or this needs more seed. But one of the coolest things that we found out about it is that through some of these iterations of doing it is it's really just a cool community building uh, exercise, in fact, too, where we get people of all different skill types. You have PhD level botanists like Karen. Um, you have first timers out that know maybe a handful of plants, but everyone is able to contribute and keep people honest, too. Um, you know, as a land manager, sometimes I like to put on my uh, rose colored glasses and say, oh, yeah, isn't this site looking great? And then, you know, somebody who maybe it's only a third time out to a natural area says, well, what's that plant over there? Oh, man, there's a giant patch of reconary grass. So maybe, maybe we do need to have, to have more work on this yet, too. Um, so it's been just a real cool uh, community builder activity. Yeah, and it does lend itself just straight into stewardship because you end up focusing on the stuff you need to do something about. It, um, and that's the way it's supposed to be designed. And so it can really help new and seasoned stewards think through, oh, okay, yeah, we got to focus on that patch of weeds, but we're really missing some of the conservative species. And I hadn't really thought about that before. So I got to make sure I get those in the seed collection this year. So I, uh, I think we all started to realize that the community building and consensus thought process was the most useful part of it. Even though the graphs and the maps are really fun and cool, the process seemed to be as important as the numbers. Looks like Peter Winkler asked too, do you burn CFC owned sites with all volunteer crews? Uh, yes, yeah, we do. Uh, they're primarily volunteer crews. Um, it's, uh, we have a couple staff members from the Friends of the Forest Preserve, which uh, is a conservation core group of young individuals exploring you know, conservation careers. So they, they'll join us on some of the burns but otherwise it's all by uh, volunteer staffed. And so we, we burn only CFC sites right now, but we've been in the works with the Lake County Forest Preserves to create more of this joint task force for getting some of the highest quality remnant areas burned over here. Uh, similar to John McCabe's presentation yesterday too, where we'll have a few Lake County staff people come out and then staff the rest of the burn with volunteers and get more fire in areas like Gila Prairie and some other remnant areas. And Mark, we don't have a document summarizing the methodology. It's more of a, um, what do we call it? Uh, uh, experiential learning. We think it seems to be the best way to learn it is to just go out and try it because it doesn't really go the way you think it's going to go. Um, so come join us. Carol Johnson asks, do you have any working relationship with park districts? And we absolutely do. In fact, one of um, the probably one of the best sites that we are able to manage is owned by the village of Barrington. So it's not even uh, one of our true properties. So there's a small little remnant savanna on the northwest corner of Baker's Lake. That's all been owned through uh, the village of Barrington. Um, but we've had a longstanding agreement with the village to be able to do all these ecological um, management tasks on it, such as the prescribed burning brush cutting and managing invasives. Mary Kozabas, hey Mary, uh, can you use a drone for monitoring? We absolutely do. And we have had a lot of volunteers actually um, with drones out, which has been kind of nice. Uh, I think there's been a big boom in people experimenting with learning how to use drones and looking for something to do and a really great way to get people out. We've used them on prescribed burns before. Um, and I think it'd be cool to start getting that more into the, uh, the true monitoring side of things. Uh, I just realized I wasn't scrolling down, saw a question from Steve Packard. Um, super quickly, uh, what were the Chicago Wilderness Woods Audit and Land Audits about? We sent volunteers out uh, to random spots throughout the region uh, collecting standard data like the kind we just described um, to get a snapshot of the quality and condition of the preserves. And they were hugely influential in helping the Forest Preserve make its um, wonderful transition towards better care of the land. And they've just been a continued source of really useful data when you want to compare how things have changed in the past 20 years. I have the data, um, as do other people. So if anybody ever wants any of it, just let me know. 